So we're going to keep going here and talk about the, uh, the record here in Titus about the elders holding firm to the word, the, the word of faith, according to the teaching, so that he may be able to instruct in sound doctrine, and so that he may be able to rebuke, to rebuke those who contradict him, or contradict it, rather, excuse me, who contradict the Lord, is what I mean, uh, the teaching. Uh, we, we did get uh, through quite a few things, and yet we continue to have other things that need to be studied. So we're looking specifically at the ability to give instruction in sound doctrine as we pick up here pretty close to where we left off. But we're already headed towards the next thing, which is the ability to rebuke those who contradict. So as we got, start going down that slope, <laughs> uh, draw your mind back to what is contrary to sound teaching. At 1 Timothy 6, consider what is contrary to the sound or the healthful. This is another of the early writings of Paul. If anyone teaches a different doctrine, 1 Timothy 6, 3-5, and does not agree with the wholesome words, the, the healthful words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy, for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, constant friction among people depraved in mind and deprived of truth. They even imagine that godliness is a means of gain. So for some of these, it's about money somehow. But it's saying, when somebody is a, a teacher, someone who espouses a teaching, a doctrine that is not the doctrine of God, a different doctrine, and this person also does not agree with the wholesome, the healthful teachings and words of our Lord Christ, you have a very serious problem on your hands. That's a different doctrine. That's a refusal to accept the wholesome teaching of the Lord. That person has this problem. He's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. How do you know this? Have you ever met the guy? Well, you don't have to. You know because he is teaching a different doctrine. He will not consent to the wholesome words of the Lord and the teaching that accords with godliness. That's all you need to know to tell you his problem is pride. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy, quarrels about words. The product of these things are envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction. That's what happens when pride is the driver and the person is not consenting to the wholesome teaching of the Lord. People depraved in mind, deprived of truth, and imagining godliness to be gain. That's contrary to healthful. That makes for things that are not healthy. Outcomes you do not want. Over in Titus chapter 1, similarly, one of the preachers that Paul uh, has taken under his wing and has set out into the Greek city-states, he writes to this Gentlemen, Titus, saying, Titus 1, 12-14, One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This prophet's testimony is true. Therefore rebuke the church sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. They need to have healthfulness, a strong state of health, when it comes to the faith. Because what the prophet said was true. Always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. That's pretty harsh. But Paul said it's also accurate. So rebuke them. How do they become sound in the faith? Well, they do so by not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. And those who turn away from the truth, we follow up in the 16th verse, profess to know God, but 
they deny him by their works. They're detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. But as for you, Titus, you teach what accords with sound doctrine, sound teaching, healthful teaching. So this also is a charge for the evangelist that he is to teach what is sound. He, his doctrine should be what makes for good health. That's true. But it's just helping us to understand what the opposite of this is, what it looks like when they're not healthy, when they're not what they should be. Also, in, his closing in the closing of his letter, 2 Timothy 4, which is probably the last letter he wrote, Paul also said, in verses 3 and 4. The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Rather, they will have itching ears and accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. We read back in Titus how that they are not to devote themselves to myths, and other things that do not profit, that do not make for health. Here, he said, the time is nigh. The time is here. People will not put up with sound teaching, sound, healthful teaching, what is good, what is right. Instead, they will accumulate teachers to suit their own passions. That's the contrary of sound. What is it like? It's like candy. If it were up to us, we would live on a diet of candy, especially when we are seven years old. But that is not going to produce health and strength and longevity. That is not what is good for you. So also in the spirit sometimes, people want what they want, their own desires, not what God says. And they accumulate for themselves teachers. Don't let anyone tell you that the false teacher is the Pied Piper of Hamlin, who shows up and tricks all the adults into thinking he's cool and great, and then and just secrets away the children out from under their noses. That's not how it works. The false teacher doesn't work that way. The false teacher was hired and acquired and brought here by the people who worship here because that's what they want to hear. That's how it is. <laughs> it comes from us, from our desires to suit our own passions. We'll find somebody who will teach it, and that's the one we'll support, and that's the one we'll bring. So what about this ability to rebuke those who contradict? Well, he has to be able to teach, and he has to be able to prescribe, like the doctor. Give the prescription for what is the good thing, what is the right thing, what should we do? He also has to be able, equally, to rebuke those who contradict the sound teaching. Well, we should define the term rebuke, and we should define the term contradict. So let's start with rebuke. Rebuke actually has multiple different meanings. They're all very similar, but I wanted to go with the dictionary categories and bring forward verses that show those things just to get this idea in mind because I think it's helpful for us to think about this is what elders are going to do, what they have to be able to do. First, it means cross-examine or question. Come down on a side, you know, decide a, disp a dispute. Cross-examine, question, decide a dispute. You know, come down to what what is believable here, what is true. That's the first meaning for rebuke. I think the best example of that is found in Matthew 18, verse 15, where Jesus said, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. This word that is described or that is translated tell him his fault is actually the same word as rebuke in Titus 1.9. So we're not necessarily saying that you are mean <laughs> or sharp or harsh 
about this. We're just saying you are willing to go to somebody personally and tell them what is wrong or that they are wrong. And here is where it is wrong. And if he listens to you, you've gained your brother, is what Matthew 18 says. That's the point of a rebuke. The point of cross-examining, of questioning, of coming down on the truth here is that somebody can believe that truth. And if they haven't been living right, they can repent and begin to live right. That's the point. Another meaning for rebuke is prove or bring a convincing proof of a thing. Um, I've got two verses for this. Um, in, in Well, two passages. John 16 is one passage, and Hebrews 11 is the other. First, in John 16, Jesus said, The Holy Spirit, who is the Helper, will be sent, and he will help the apostles, it says, when he comes, John 16 and verse 8, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. This one is going to convict the world. It's this, this word for convict is the word rebuke in Titus 1.9. It is that proof, that convincing proof that is brought forward. The Holy Spirit brings the proof that convicts the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. What is that? It's the Bible. The Bible is the thing that convicts us of sin. It convicts us of what is just and right, the justice of God, and of the judgment that is coming. These are elementary principles of Christ. Concerning sin, because they don't believe me. Righteousness, because I go to the Father and you see me no longer. And judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. The word overturns every expectation of man, and that's the idea. The Holy Spirit, when he comes and brings the entirety of the word, brings this conviction, this proof from God. It's the proof that the world demands, the Bible is. The other passage, as we mentioned, is Hebrews 11 and verse 1, where faith is the conviction of things not seen, meaning the convincing proof. The assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Meaning, you're sure that what you hope for is real. You're convinced that things you, you, you don't see with your eyes are there. As in spiritual things. Spiritual reality is reality for you when you have faith. So this is also part of the uh, rebuke from the elder. It is bringing that convincing proof. You see why he has to know the Bible well. But the other thing that it means is to refute or confute, meaning which are both kind of older English words that mean correct, <laughs> put back into its rightful place. Um that idea is rebuke as well. And now we're getting down to some meanings that are more like what we think rebuke would mean. We just read in Titus 1.13 how there was a prophet that said some horrible things about them, but the response to that was, Titus, that prophet is right. They are like this. So rebuke the Cretans sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. See, that's the correction, putting right. Set this record straight. Furthermore, in Titus 2, at verse 15, he tells Titus, Tell, Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one disregard you. That means let no one get around you. And it's interesting that he has the requirement to exhort and to rebuke too. He has to encourage the way that the elder encourages through his instructions. And he has to rebuke the way that the elder rebukes. 
by means of, as we said, questioning, cross-examining, bringing forth the proof that is God's word. These are the things that have to be done. And when you think about it in these terms, you realize that the elder has to be able to do both instruction and rebuke because it's that dual purpose of the the word of God bringing you know the blessings, but all, the prescription, but also the discipline when we fail to do it. It's that dual purpose of you know the goodness and the severity of God. If God's word provides for blessing and justice and vindication if we are living right, but it also provides for rebuke and correction and justice if we're living wrong. <laughs> As the little kids say, I don't like that song. What song? God will take care of you. <laughs> but he will take care of you. Yes, whether I do right or whether I do wrong, <laughs> he will take care of you. Yeah, well, that's true, actually. So the elder has to repro uh, reprove and to rebuke and to exhort, too. Um, you see how that's working. Another person famously who did this was John the Baptist in Luke 3. You may recall that John the Baptist was imprisoned by Herod because of Herodias. Herod had married his brother's wife out from under him because he had the authority to do so as the ruler. And John didn't let him get away with it, did not let it slide. Herod the Tetrarch, Luke 3, 19-20 records, who had been reproved by John for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked John up in prison. But notice, at 319, John the Baptist reproved Herod for this sinful marriage. And that's the same word for rebuke in Titus 1.9, where the elders have to be able to rebuke those who contradict. And Herod, by the way, is a Gentile, not a Jew. In case you're thinking that God's law of marriage only applies to God's people. That is incorrect. John lost his head for that. It's a shame that people still don't get it. The other rebuke um, passages would be 1 Timothy 5.20, where the evangelist is instructed to rebuke any elders who do not continue faithfully. As for those elders who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, that the rest may stand in fear. All the elders need to be concerned about doing right and about being right in God's eyes and being called into question by the servant of God, the, the evangelist in this case. But there's also Hebrews 12, which I think is worth looking at in the context of discipline. Hebrews 12, 5 and 6. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when rebuked by him. The Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. And Jesus says the same thing in the Revelation. Revelation 3, 19. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. So our, our God also reproves us. He corrects us. He cross-examines and questions us. That's the nature of the God that we serve. Like we said, it's goodness and severity. He will take care of you. <laughs> but truly, we do receive reproof and discipline from him. And he says, be zealous, repent. If there's sin, the, the answer to that is to repent. There's another meaning for rebuke a little further down, which is getting even sharper. And that's how this goes, which is expose or betray a weakness, as in find what is wrong here and make it clear. Expose it. Well, the first place that you start seeing this is Jesus teaching Nicodemus. When he says to him in John 3.20, everyone who does wicked things hates the light 
and doesn't come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. If somebody does what is wicked, he hates the light. He doesn't want the light to be turned on because the light exposes. It betrays his weakness, that is, the fact that he's doing evil. He doesn't want it to be openly seen that he's doing evil. Well, it's the elder's job to turn that light on. And you've got Ephesians 5, 11 to 13. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. Instead, expose them. It's shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Right, the light of God's word exposes error. And by the way, that 11th verse, take no part, means have no fellowship. Not only do we refuse to go along with that, but we actually will take the steps to expose it. Show what that is. Shed the light on that thing. Let people know what that is. Expose it by the light to make it visible. So do the elders do that? Well, yes, this is one of their jobs. It's one of their very important jobs. They have to be able to prescribe what is right, to give instruction in sound doctrine for what makes for good spiritual health, for what the church ought to do, for what individuals in the church ought to do in their lives. You should be able to come to them for advice and get sound advice from God's word. Yes, the other side of this, though, is for those who refuse to do what is right. He also has the strength to rebuke them which includes exposing error, shedding a light on that. What is error? Well, it is those who contradict. Are they contradicting the elder? Well, maybe, but that's not the point and that's not important. You forget about that, dear friend. God will pay all of us back. No, um... This is about contradicting the teaching of God. We don't allow the contradiction of God's word to stand. You can contradict me and say I'm a bad guy, and I'll keep, I'll keep teaching. Now, I may or may not say anything about it, but you can't contradict God's word and have me stand by idly. I won't do that. That's got to be stopped. We won't let the truth uh, be mangled or covered up. And I, as an evangelist, have that charge. Elders have the same charge. Contradict in the dictionary, uh, that is the Greek dictionary for this word, is speaking against something, contradicting it, but also providing an alternate, an alternate story, a, a different narrative here. Right? Somebody says it's thus this way, but you come up with a different way that it is. Well, no, that's not how it is. It's really like this. Here's the story. Right? That's contradiction. And it's also to get up as the speaker or the leader of the opposition party. That's what contradict means. Where does it happen in the New Testament? Well, one of the first places we find it is in Luke 2, when Jesus is first brought into the temple and the prophets bless him, already they have this to say that he is a sign that is to be opposed, contradicted. He comes into a world of contradiction. And that's how it's going to be. They never promised a peaceful transition of power. <laughs> Luke 2, 33 to 35, his father and mother marveled at what was said about him, and Simeon, the prophet, blessed them, said to Miriam, Miriam, his mother, Behold, this child's appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel, for a sign that is opposed, that is contradicted. A sword will pierce through your own soul too, Mary, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. The opposition to him reveals the thoughts of many hearts. Meaning, where will you stand? If, in the end, you are a Christian, your heart is revealed. If, in the end, you are not a Christian, your heart is revealed too. Right? That's how contradictions work. 
But I'd like to look at Luke 20 um, to start looking at some examples of what does it mean then to rebuke those who contradict. I think King James says convict the gainsayer. Apparently gainsayer is, well, King James English for contradict. <laughs> Um, Luke 20 is a case where you have Sadducees come to Jesus to test him and they have a contradiction of God's word which is they deny that there is a resurrection that word for the Sadducees deny that's contradict <coughs> so these are some of the people that the elders need to rebuke and expose So they came up and said, hey, you know, Moses has this thing about a wife, you know, marrying uh, and having no children and that his, the man, uh, you know, a man, a man, a brother has to take his brother's widow and raise up offspring for him. And so they come, they've come up with this thing they think is a real problem for resurrection, that this woman has seven husbands, none of them had children, you know, whose husband? They said, in the resurrection, whose wife will the woman be? They, seven of them, had her as the wife. They thought that they had the winning argument here. First, Jesus answered the problem of marriage, saying, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, not the resurrected. First of all, you got, that's irrelevant. But the more important thing is what he says, beginning at verse 37. But that the dead are raised. <laughs> now, uh, allow me to, you know, respond to your charge that the dead are not raised. We know what you really believe, Sadducees. Now we're going to answer that. Let me show you from the scriptures that the dead are raised. Even Moses showed that. You don't need anything farther than Exodus 3 to understand this. In the passage about the burning bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. What does it mean? Well, in Exodus 3, when Moses sees the burning bush and God speaks to him from the bush, he says, Who are you? And God says, I am the God, the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. In that time, that is, while Moses was alive, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been dead for 400 years. Can God say, I am the God of Abraham, who died 400 years ago, if Abraham is dead, without being the God of the dead? <laughs> well, no. right? He's the God of the living. That proves that Abraham, Abraham is living... That's why God said what he did, I am the God of Abraham, because he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. All live for him. When he says to Moses about these men who left the earth 400 years earlier, I am their God, and we know he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, we know therefore that they were still living 400 years later. That tells you that there is resurrection from the dead. Is this a rebuke? Yes, it is. It lays bare what is wrong with their thinking and what is wrong with their teaching. They are arguing something crazy from a weird angle about a passage that has nothing to do with life after death. And the very plain most simple, fundamental, foundational passages of the entire nation, <laughs> Moses and the burning bush, make clear that the dead are raised. Is that rebuke? Yes, it is. The scribes, some of the scribes said, Teacher, you've spoken well, because they no longer dared to ask him anything. <laughs> Not because he was mean, not because he was harsh um, or rallied anybody to his side, but because he used the Bible effectively to demonstrate that they were fundamentally wrong. 
and to show the truth. That's what you're supposed to be able to do. In Acts 13, Paul um, and Barnabas, I believe, are preaching in the synagogue. And they talked about the spread of the word of God to all nations, not just Israel. And you find in the 42nd verse, as they were leaving, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. So down at the 44th verse beginning, the next Sabbath, almost the entire city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. So the city came together to hear the gospel of Jesus, and when that happened, jealousy motivated those who had been there already to contradict Paul and revile him. This is the kind of contradiction that needs to be exposed and rebuked, and that's what you're reading in the very next verses. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the nations. And he begins from there to show all the things in the scriptures that, sh that made this so. And you can read more about it, but you get the idea. We started in Matthew 18 with this, where he said, you know, where he said, you, you go and talk to your brother, you know, in some matter, some personal private matter, you go talk to him between you and him alone, and if he listens to you, you want your brother. That's going to somebody, showing them where they were wrong, seeing to it that correction comes. Here, that same kernel is still there. The they went to the Jews who were there and preached the truth to them. But the following uh, week, when they gathered, the Jews who were there changed their tune entirely and started to contradict. And when that happened, the word, the word was used against them. You thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. The word is harsh, but not Paul and Barnabas. You see, this is the kind of uh, rebuke that we're talking about. And probably one of the most important ones is Jude 11. where he says, Woe to those that create divisions. They walked in the way of Cain. And you know Cain sacrificed Abel because Abel's deeds were good and his own were evil. They abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error. Remember Balaam sold out the Lord and sold out the people. He took the money. And they perished in Korah's rebellion. You remember Korah, who stood up in number 16 and accused Moses and Aaron of doing all of this for personal gain. And said, well, you said that the Lord chose Aaron to be his priest, but we are telling a different story here. All of the people can have priests. Every one of them is holy. You've taken too much upon yourselves, Moses and Aaron. That's Korah. You know, the word there for rebellion is not rebellion. It's contradiction. They are doing the very thing that Titus 1.9 is saying the elders must rebuke. So if you go back and read through number 16 and you look at how Korah behaved himself, that's how members of the church behave sometimes. And the elders have to deal with that. They have to rebuke it. They have to expose it. They have to use the scriptures to fight it. And that's a whole lesson unto itself to examine what Korah did and his contradiction. But that contradiction, you look at what he did. He stood up at a time when the people refused to do God's will 
And because they refused to take the promised land, therefore he cursed them to die in that wilderness. And it was at that point that Korah and Dathan and Abiram stood up and said, You've gone far enough, Moses and Aaron. This is all, you're just in this for a personal gain. And they tried to start over with a new religion, a different way. You see how they supplied their own narrative that was the contrary of the truth and maligned the servants of God in doing it. That is contradiction. It's a whole lesson to itself. But one that I find the most chilling is Hebrews 12 and verse 3, where we speak about how Jesus suffered. And it says, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. You know, this word in Hebrews 12, 13 for hostility is actually contradiction. It's what was pointed out this morning in Bible class, how that when Jesus was dying on the cross, the priestly class stood in front of him and said, he said he was God's son. Let God save him now if, he please, if he's pleased with him. Let him come down from the cross if he's the king and so powerful. That's the contradiction. They had a different story, a different God, a different king, a different take on everything that had happened and why he was there, and why this was taking place. You see how it works? That's the contradiction. Yes, it's hostility. But at its base, it's contradiction. Why do we, again, why do we say this? Because it's important to understand, uh, it's important to understand what the text has in mind when uh, it says he has to give sound instruction or instruction in sound teaching, that's for building, for prescribing, for growing, and he has to be able to rebuke contradiction because there are Korahs in the churches. There are Sadducees in the churches. Right? There are... Um, some, like the Jews of old, who would contradict for various reasons and prevent the spread of the truth. And these have to be exposed. These have to be rebuked. They have, the error that they are in has to be shown. But if you go back to the original context in Titus 1 with me, Paul actually gives a very precise reason for this. Uh, I need verse 9 again. Oh yes, here we are. The elder must hold firm to the word of faith that accords with the teaching, so that he may be able both to encourage by means of his own healthful teaching and also to cross-examine those who contradict it, because, verse 10, there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Who does that? The elders do that. People lose sight of this. They think the elder is, a, is you know, a tottering old grandpa, <laughs> you know, and you sit on his lap and he gives you a gentle correction and sends you off to play. No, that's not the job of the elder. No, that's not it. The elder has to know the word well enough to prescribe what is good. If you are a good and well-intended person, you can take that learning from him. But also he has to know it well enough to rebuke people who are not really God's servants. They need to be exposed. They need to be silenced. They need to be eradicated from the number. That's what elders do. 
it's like any shepherd. Remember that a shepherd's crook, a shepherd's staff, you know, it has a nice curvy side, you know, little bow peep, right? <laughs> That's for grabbing a sheep who has gone astray and pulling them back, right? But nobody ever talks about the other end of that staff, you know, when he's standing there holding it to the ground. Why is it so firm on the ground? Because that end is pointy. That's why. Why is that end pointy? Well, it's a goad. It's a goad. Sometimes sheep need a little more cajoling. That's fair. Sometimes we need a little something to wake us up. But it's also his only defense when the wolf comes. Wolves are quite large and ferocious, and that's a serious problem if you are a dude on your own in the middle of the wilderness with nothing but sheep around you. No matter how much you try to train sheep, they are never going to be fighting the wolf. <laughs> it's just not going to work that way. It's you and that staff against the wolf. That's how it is. So they have the shepherd's crook, yes, but they also have a pointed end there to take care of that wolf. That's what they have to do. And the scripture says there are many insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers. He has to be able to rebuke the contradiction because the insubordinate contradict. The empty talkers contradict. The deceivers contradict. What are they to do in the 11th verse? It says they must be silenced. You know this literally is saying put something over their mouth. Their mouths must be stopped up is literally what it says. Now, I know it's not talking about physical assault. It, Even though the literal language is, put a sock in it, right? Figuratively, what that means is, he takes away their opportunity to speak. When someone is a false teacher, when somebody is espousing a different doctrine, that somebody does not lead prayers, does not lead singing, does not teach class, does not come here to hold the gospel meeting. They are silenced. And if they're reaching out to individual families who are here, since they upset all families, then the elders can do something about that too. What would that be? Well, they would talk to those families and say, you should not open letters from these individuals or don't listen to what they have to say. Here's what the Bible says about this. And put a stop to it. They have to do this to protect the flock. So he gave a reason, a very precise reason, why the work of the elder is that twofold encouragement in healthful teaching and cross-examination for people who contradict. And so, in our earlier lesson, in closing here, you know, in our earlier lessons, we did, we talked about, um, we talked about the fact that um, most of the requirements for the elders are things that you and I are also required to do when whether we're trying to be elders or not. In this series of lessons out of Titus 1.9, we are talking about things that require more maturity than average. This is why they are older. They're older than average. This is why they have children who have obeyed the gospel. They have had some time and nobody's children are immune to the influences of the world. They have shown their children what is right. right. So they need the experience to be the kind of person who can give the right prescription and also who can identify and isolate error and those who teach it. It doesn't mean they're mean. It doesn't mean that they're 
more intelligent or educated or super sharp over other people. It just means that they hold fast to the Word of God. They know what the Word of God says, and they will use that Word to stop error and to stop those that teach it, as well as to prescribe what is good and right for the church to do. So yeah, it is over and above. It is a maturity. An elder has to be somebody who knows the Word, who can teach the Word, who can bind the Word on others, that they must do this and they must teach this as well. And that if they won't teach this or if they teach something else, well, they won't be coming here. They won't be affecting this flock. We're not going to let that gain an audience here. It is their job to do this. And this is the order of God for the congregations. All right. Well, we have other things to talk about. Like I say, let me know if you have any questions, and we'll try to get those into our question and answer lesson, or lessons, depending on how many questions there are, and answers, I guess. <laughs> how many answers there are. <laughs> All right. Thank you for your kind attention. If today you have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus, obey. God is both good and severe. It's severe if we do not obey him. Our, our soul is in jeopardy. Our eternal life hangs in the balance. If you do not obey, there is only hell for those who do not obey, who do not love him, who will not choose to own him above the shamefulness of this twisted and crooked generation. But on the other hand, if you do believe in him and you do obey him, there is great mercy and there is forgiveness available. You become a Christian, a child of God. That's how you do, uh, or that's why you do what you do. When you repent, when you confess that he is the Christ, the Son of God, when you are buried in uh, baptism for forgiveness of your sins. The blood of Jesus washes away every sin you putting to death the old person and resurrected a new person in Christ Jesus. Created in him for, work, for good works. If today you haven't walked in the good works, repent, Christian friend. Make things right. And let us pray with you for you. If you need our prayers, you need to be baptized. Let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing. <laughs>